Joe Ben and what I said in the last time we got together is this thought of the, the friends coming and bringing up things that nobody else can do. And let me make something real clear about that. That's not just a trial we go through. That's God ordering the most specific thing to reach us. In other words, if we simply read that as the unkindnesses of the people that we have trusted ourselves to, are you following me? Yes. Yeah. Then all we're going to do is hurt, except hurt deeper. Because I mean, that's the deepest hurt you're, you're going to go to. God will use your friends. God will use your loved ones. God will use the ones that you are closest to or that you care about God will use that. That's not just out of control or random situations. And the truth is, many times we can't be reached on a surface level. And so, these things are ordered of the Lord because nothing will move you outside of those, those things. Nothing will reach you outside of those things. <clears throat> well, we can, you know, Job's initial reaction to this was to feel hurt, to feel betrayed. Do these words sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> hurt, betrayed. Well, you know, who is it that betrays you? Somebody what? Someone you trust. Someone you trust. Someone you trust. And so we get all freaked out because we're not aware that that's not just a that's not just a situation that happened that you're you've been faced with the fact that your friends don't really care about you. That's not what it's about. Let me give you an example. Um, now, come on. And, uh, we don't know, you know, we're just living life, so these things happen to us. Here, come a little closer so we get it. We're just living life, so we don't really understand what happened. But here's what happened. You see this shirt? Don't bug me. Don't bug me is what it says. You see that? Because <laughs> well, we don't that. really know what's going on. Did you see this shirt? God is in control. <laughs> <laughs> So we, what we think, and, and here is, I mean, I've said this a million times in many ways to you, but the truth is, you're not just living randomly in this world, and certain events just seem to happen your way, and other people seem to have better things. <laughs> that's not the case. I promise you that that is not the case. God is in control. Thank you. Amen? Amen. Now, if we view it wrong, then we're going to miss, like the last part of, what, of the book that Kevin was reading, we're going to miss the eternal plan of God. Mm. Let me tell you something. God, your Father that loves you, will turn mm. your friends against you. <laughs> to bring you to a revelation of Christ because you will be happier conformed to the image of the Son. You will be happier. Uh, when Joseph was reading it, it, I didn't particularly like the one wording there, but it, it, it is there where it says in Ephesians 1, it says uh, that he wants to uh, present you, I forget how it is, without spot or blemish. Remember the scripture in the, the verse 4, I think, in verse 5, verse 4 and 5. Um, and then it turns right around verse 6 and says, but we're accepted in the beloved. Now what is, what is that? Is he trying to make us without spot and blemish so that we're accepted in ourselves? Or is he trying to make us accepted in the beloved? And I'll tell you, 
that he's trying to conform us to the image of Christ so that we draw all from his love. Mm -hmm. The son that is accepted is the resurrected son of which we are a part. In other words, he's not just trying to perfect you individually, but he's trying to join you in union with his son and accept that son and you in that son. Well, most of us don't live according to that. We're, we're living according to our individual, you know, capsule called whatever our name is. And we're led to our body. And we are just going through life and waiting for things to happen and reacting to those things. When if you understand your covenant with the Lord, the Lord's covenant with you in Christ, you are predestinated. What? For salvation? No. Prede your life is predestinated so that you don't have to make any decisions or do the right thing. You're just going to do what you're going to do because you're predestinated in this life? No. Well, let me just say, from the scriptures that I'm referring to in Ephesians, no. <laughs> But rather, you are predestinated to become conformed to the image of his son. And what does that mean? That means that you will have to come to this time. Yes. You understand that? Now, you can either come to it and just suffer and feel rejected and self-pity and upset and, you know, hacked off at your friends, your loved ones, your family. And you can spend the rest of your life being bitter. Kind of get a witness. But you can. You, you can. You can. You can get bitter and you can just just stay bitter and actually grow more bitter. You know. I mean, can you imagine Job? See, Job had to pray for these guys at the end of this thing. Did you know that? God had to had him pray for them. Because Job could have seen Jesus, but every time he saw his friends, he said, Well, yeah, you know, you guys weren't there for me. It's not that they weren't there for you. They were there for That's you right. in the capacity that they could be, which is pretty much to hack you off. That's right. You know? That's right. They played a role that nobody else could play. That's right. Amen. That's right. And it, was, and it was important to you. Without them, you never would have come to that point. So you can, you can either just blame them all your life, or you can say, thank you, Jesus, for bringing them just at this right time. Thank you for not letting them stand with me in that sense, because I never would have seen you. And love them, and bless them, and another word, release them. Release them. You're holding them in bondage. You know, there are examples, folks, where God sent a lying spirit or blinded people or did all sorts of stuff to bring people to a certain place so that they can affect the Son of God in that situation. And I'm telling you that, that, that for you to get all wrapped up in the circumstances of the moment is to, is to not only miss the eternal plan of God, but it is to put yourself in worse as a reactionary in a worse way than you would have had you never been put in those situations. And he probably wouldn't have put you in those situations except that he wanted to get his son out of it. He wanted Christ revealed in him. So, you know, uh, in, the, in the scriptures when Elihu is talking and everything, he starts talking about the storm and and God starts talking about the storm. It's a beautiful picture because he talks about the clouds. The storm rolls in and the clouds block the sun. Mm -hmm. you know. So now it's dark. Mm -hmm. And now it's stormy. And uh, I was recently in Arizona. We were up in the mountains. And uh, one of the nights, just this terrible lightning storm went through. I mean, it popping loud, and of course you you know it's going all through the mountains, so I mean it's really having the echo effect and everything like that. And uh, you know, I don't remember going, oh my God, you know, God's gonna kill me, or it's bad, or I'm scared, you know. But that storm does start blocking the sun, and 
that begins to prove to you where you are at in this thing. If you are stable only by the most recent seeing of the sun, then you're still up there. But if your stability is when the storm rolls in and the darkness rolls in, the clouds are there, and you can say, the sun has not moved. It is still there. It will always be there. What will move is these clouds. What will eventually move is this storm. This storm will not stay here forever and ever and ever. And ever. It will not. And I will see the sun again. But it is not the seeing of the sun that holds me at this moment. It is the knowing that I'm one with him right now where he is. Amen? And I've used this example before, but it's like an airplane. And I've recently in both situations coming and going saw this where you, you're going up into the clouds and I mean it just looks like this soup and everything and all of a sudden the nose of that plane pokes out on top and I mean it's just it's not gray up there, it's beautiful, it's bright and the clouds look like it's pure snow and it's incredible. And it's the same day. <laughs> The, the, the situation has not changed. It's just your perspective, your location has changed. Can I get amen? Mm -hmm. yes. When will we get this? Come on. Come on. When are we going to get this? Because what, what we, the information, it's not that we don't have the information. When are we going to insist that our lives be ordered after the truth as it is in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That our lives, that our, no, you see, nobody can, nobody can order your life for you after Christ. Only you. Mm -hmm. Only you make those decisions. Only, only as your government opens to his government. Only as your will opens to his will and says, not my will. Only as you leave your land and come into his land. Yes, yes. Not theologically. Actually. Mm -hmm. So that when you see the storm, if, if you, I mean, if you, because you know that, if you write that down about the plane knows enough, if you write it down and you say, my God, I'm going to carry this in my pocket till, till it's in me, and every time I get in this situation, I'm going to pull it out and go, da, 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 yes, Lord, until it's in me. Is that not a bad idea? That's not a bad idea. Put it in a notebook that you carry with you. See to it that you, you know, like Joshua, keep the word before your eyes. Meditate on it day and night. Yes. Don't just do it when you're in trouble. That's right. <laughs> you know? But, but read it and meditate on it and think about it. And just consider this. What if you just kind of gave yourself just to that one area for a while? Until it became part of you. You, didn't, you said, you know what? I ain't going to try to study anything else. I'm not going to try to get anything else down. I am going to try to get this in me so much so that my reactions and thought patterns come from above and not the earth. So that, so that when, one day when a storm rolls in and all of a sudden I wasn't thinking about it, I don't react at all. But I have the same calm as Jesus going to sleep in the boat when the storm rolled in. I'm impressed and everyone else is freaking out. Yes, yes. And, and staying with this, because don't you think this is important? This is important. But if you don't, then see, when we put it on that level, it's a little easier because we look at the storm as dark clouds and thunder and lightning. Okay. Let's change the face of the storm. You with me? You ready? Your friends. People you love. People that have respected you, stood with you, turned against you. That's what happened to Job. That was Job's storm. That's what that's when he's talking about the storm. Specifically, that's what he's talking about. Amen? Amen. So let's quit romanticizing this thing and putting it off into some cloudy little there there. You know, it's not those kind of storms that most of us are dealing with. 
We're dealing with the storms of situations that hurt. We're not, it's not that we're afraid a lightning bolt is going to come out of there and hurt me. Somebody said something that hurt me. Somebody has done something that hurt me. And you can live above that. You can live above that in Christ. You can be with the Lord. And not only, not only not let the storm affect you, but let the life of Christ affect you in for those who are in the storm. That's right. And that's a key. Yes. You're not really in the storm. But you're not just flying up there above everything, enjoying it, looking down at all the people <laughs> freaking out. You know, yeah. Yeah, a bunch of sissies, I told you to get this. <laughs> she didn't get it, so suffer. Oh, you get right back down there in the storm, but you're unaffected, and you want to reach those. That's right. So that in the end, you're the one doing the praying for them. That's right. They're and they're the storm. They're the storm. They're the hurtful part. They're the part that can raise bitterness within you. And you, one way, let me tell you something. One way to overcome bitterness. Just to pray for something. That's right. Now there's more to it than that. But it's true that every time you really get in, if you get in God's face with a prayer about somebody else, it's hard to go, oh Lord, kill them, or whatever. <laughs> it's real different. You know what I mean? Kind of go, oh Lord, I just, you know, Lamb of God, just make me more like you, help them. <laughs> you know, it just, it just melts your heart. <laughs> and so, you realize that this thing is, is that the storm is and the problem is not people. There's an old saying I haven't said in a while. The issue is not the issue. Woo! I know Mallory and Kelly remember that one because they got that one a lot growing up. And Kevin, the issue is not the issue. Everyone in this room listening to the tape, watching the video, the issue is not the issue. God is the issue. Christ found in you is the issue. Let this mind be in you. He can't force it. He says, let. Let is a word of submission, not a word of you know, grabbing or force. It is that you allow this to be your mind. That's what, when it says, let this mind be in you, he's saying, allow this to be your mind, who didn't raise him up, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, who made himself as a servant. You know? And I'm telling you that this stuff starts working in you where you're more interested in seeing other people succeed than yourself. You're more interested in, but see, you might say, well, these three guys, they don't deserve anything. Look how they act. Well, do you think that you're not just as bad? And I, and if you measure yourself with him, you look pretty good. If you measure yourself by the Lord, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the merciful, mm -hmm. for they shall obtain mercy. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Well, there's a spirit behind that. That's not just a, a commandment to be right. obeyed. Mm -hmm. You are not merciful. Mm -hmm. you know, in the Roman Colosseum, you're Caesar. Yeah. Yeah. Kill him! You know? Kill him! When Christ is in you, your hand is not your own. Instead of, you, know, you might want to go, <laughs> but you know you're thinking they don't deserve to live. It just takes a little bit of meditation to realize I don't deserve to live. Amen. It just takes a little bit of realization the only one ever meant to live is Christ in his body. Hallelujah. Through your personality, yes. Christ's life and nature is the victory, and it's going to be the only victory we have. I don't know, I forget what time we started. 
But I just think of Job's words in the last chapter when he said, you know, I've heard of thee. And there's a big difference between hearing and seeing. The scriptures are full of this contrast. Many people hear the voice of God, folks. They might even be able to speak that same words back. But we need to see Jesus because the Bible says that as we look into his face, not as we hear from his voice, but as we look into his face, we're changed. There is no real change. You become a messenger when you hear his voice. You become a son of God when you see his face. Yes. You become an earthen vessel filled with a treasure when you see his face. That's a big contrast, amen? amen? Now you just consider that for a minute. You just go all over this world, all over the United States, and think how many messengers there are. What are the number of messengers as opposed to the number of those conformed to the image of Christ? I mean, it's, are the numbers astounding? Mm. And if they are, then you see the need for the revelation of Christ. The revelation of Christ is not about our ears being open. Mm -hmm. It is the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, and that we may know Him. Mm -hmm. It is the seeing of what we are and being conformed to, being changed, being transformed. And Job, who was a righteous man, well, you know, I know many a righteous man that is not conformed to the image of Christ. Amen? They do it right. And, and the whole testimony is, he's a righteous man, he prays, he does good, he gives. I mean, if you read the whole book of Job, you are getting a man that is head and shoulders above most of us. But this man literally is faced with his own shortcoming. All of a sudden, it has flooded his being that all that I was, in all of my righteousness, in all of my integrity, which by the way, all of this circumstance worked not just to reveal Christ, but to break down all of his righteousness, all of his integrity, all that he had worked for so that Christ may be seen as the fulfillment of all things. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he is confronted with that, and he says, I, I have, I, I have, I have definitely heard from God. I've heard from God over and over. I've heard from God many times. But now, and I've got to go with those words, but now, but, I have seen, uh, I have seen me, mine eyes see it. His reaction, folks, don't tell me you've come to a revelation of Christ. His reaction is, but now my eyes see it, the wherefore I abhor myself. Seeing Jesus does not make you abhor everybody else. See, Jesus affects you. That's right. Isaiah, I saw the Lord. High and lifted up. And then he says, I am unholy. My lips are unholy. And yes, I dwell among the people. But I am first and foremost is what he saw. Daniel saw the same thing. When he, when he began to see the Lord, he got sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he got sick. Over and over in the scriptures, Paul, mm -hmm. oh, wretched man that I am. The goal is not to hear, and, and let me just say this, Isaiah in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, Heard the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto him. The word, 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 words are for ears. The word of the Lord came 
And he kept condemning. Woe is you who drink strong drink. Woe unto you. Da, 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 da. Woe unto you. When he saw the Lord, he said, woe is me. First time. And he was, when he compared himself to all those other people, he was Isaiah, the prophet, the man of God. When he saw the Lord, He was wretched and miserable and needing the life of Christ. Needing mm -hmm. yes, the only thing valid. Jesus is valid and we are invalid or invalid. Mm -hmm. Unable. But you know what? We're able until we see him because it drains everything out of you. It's like John standing there and seeing Jesus and he just falls at his feet. And everything, you know, all ambition drains out of you. Now, and you know what? That doesn't mean you never do anything again. It means that you're at rest. Jesus is the Sabbath. He fulfills the things of God. You understand what that means? Yes. The Sabbath is that you cease from your own works. It doesn't mean that nothing happens. Now, it is his work that works through you, but it is effortless to you. No human sweat. It is the life of another that accomplishes the plan of God. The seeing starts with him. Then the law of contrast between him and you. And it impacts your life. Impacts it. I mean, your life is not impacted on that day. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. The original Greek meaning a past wet finished work having present results. That's literally how it is said in the grammar. Well, I say a past finished work impacting me today. I am. I am. I am crucified with Christ. I still abhor myself. Thank you for the cross. I still am lacking in meaning. I repent. Was he repenting of sin? I mean, I want you to think about it now. Was he repenting of sin? No. I mean, God declared him the most righteous man in the East. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, come on. It wasn't God. All of this didn't come down on Job's head because of it. he was such a lousy person. It came down on his head because God wanted his son, regardless of what kind of person he was. Mm -hmm. All this has come upon you. Mm -hmm. yes. Because God wants his son. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he'll never get his son as long as there's strength, as long as there's a thought that I'm good enough or I can do this. And the proof of whether I'm good enough, folks, is not your thoughts about yourself. Proof of whether you think you're good enough is when your friends, your loved ones, the big people that you respect, the people that you admire say stuff about you, and you start reacting on the inside. Hurt, self-pity, thoughts of pride, well, I'm... Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. This, is where, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where you find out and Job was responding with those things. And God finally brought him a place to reveal the Son. Mm. And when he did, for me, for my life, for me, for my life, sackcloth. Not fancy garments. You know I'm not talking about outward dress. I'm talking about the new one. That cloth in relationship to myself and ashes. Mm. Ashes. And I won't go into the time to explain the ashes, but there is a book I wrote called The Ashes of the Red Heaven. And there it begins to describe the degree that Jesus went to to reach us in our rebellion, in our death, in our wrong attitudes and our self-righteousness. He reduced himself all the way to ashes and only those ashes will save you. You are not ashes, but only the application of those ashes 
will save you now. So bound by the knowledge of the good and evil. So bound by measuring ourselves by ourselves. Instead of seeing there's only one life. And I'll never measure it. All have not only sinned, yes, all have sinned, but all also have come short. not repenting about his, his deeds. He's repenting about himself, the thoughts he had of himself, the thoughts he had in relationship to himself and others, when he sees the only life left standing after the death and in the resurrection. When he sees when he stands there, and Jesus is over here, and he stands there with Jesus in a crowd, and a voice breaks, I mean, heaven is open, and the Father speaks for the first time in the earth and says, that right there is my beloved Son, not you. And you hear that, you hear that, you hear it, you hear the Father's voice, and all of a sudden, it's clear to you. I'm not going to convince this guy. <laughs> I am not going to convince this guy. I am not going to be able to be good enough. I'm not going to be able to stay with this long enough. He will never, if I reach levels I can never reach, he's still going to look right past me and go, there's my beloved son. I might as well change my course. That's what repent means, to turn around and go another direction. We see it as somebody falling down and going, <laughs> I'm bad. No. To repent means to turn around and go another direction. Well, the, the, the direction is in the direction of the Lord. Yeah. The direction is here's the only life that pleases Him. You can, you, your first thought is, well, He's Him and I'm me, so there's no hope for me. And it is. That's your first thought. Oh, wretched man, I am. But then the answer becomes, who shall save me from this body of death? And you begin to realize your acceptance in the beloved and his life in you. And you begin to order your life not, not for God in how you proceed in this earth. You begin to order your life after Christ. Holy Spirit, I need you more than I ever did before. I'm on Holy Ghost, I'm on, I'm on ground that I don't know anything about. I'm going to have to find a brand new relationship with you. You're going to have to work this Christ in me. You're going to have to do it. Because I have seen that no other life is going to be acceptable. Not one. No, not one. Mm. And you know what? A big burden falls off of you on that day. Really, I can tell you. You don't know the weight that you've been carrying. You don't have a clue the backpack you got on. I remember I was in Europe once and we were we were somewhere in Denver in Europe and my God, the size of the backpack, some of those people. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm nervous. I mean, they're, their bodies are bent over like this with a big old, and they walk like this. And I thought, you know, I mean, you know, they're backpacking all over Europe. You know, if you do that for a year, well, I'm going to take a year out and backpack over Europe. You know, you're going to look like an old man when it's over with. <laughs> you're, well, I'm young. You're in your formative years. Your back's going <laughs> to...
I could almost find it to this day, physically, literally, in Dallas, when it hit me between the eyes, this thing is not about me at all. This is about his son. It no like, you know, and I'll say it like this, and this can be perverted to the max. It no longer matters what I do. No, I didn't mean that I could go sand and go to bars and hang out. I wasn't what I was saying. It doesn't matter about my life. It matters about his life in me. And that's, that involves doing also. But it's doing as a result of another life. I mean, I just went, oh my God, thank you, Jesus. I just went, woohoo! I'm free of all of this expectation, yes. all of this fear, all of this fear based on love. I love you, Lord. I love you so much, and I want to see the victory in my life so that you'll be glorified. And he goes, you want my glory in your life? Yes. How about Christ in you? No. Father, there's some in this room that you sent your, your servants to serve you, to help bring them to the knowledge of your son. And they've not recognized your hand in this. They've not recognized this is a storm sent by you to bring about certain things. They have unforgiveness. They have bitterness, they have reactions towards some people. If that fits you, I'm asking you to, to admit it. I'm asking you to admit it first. That you have perceived something that may be of God as just a problem in your life or just a mean person or just something like that. And I want you to admit it just by standing up right where you are and we'll finish the prayer. Now let's go on. Father, we don't want to miss you. Not a person standing wants to miss you. They love you. You wouldn't have even allowed what they're what they're we're fighting with if they didn't just deeply desire you. It is no shame, Father, that they're standing. It is glory in the sense that they are, they are pressing on. They're going to get over this. In the name of Jesus, they're going to get over this. Hallelujah. So, Father, I ask you right now in the name of Jesus to begin to show them that these things happen with purpose by your hand. And I ask you to begin to work forgiveness in their heart. And Lord, even go beyond that, thankfulness for what you are accomplishing. Lord, you brought some of some of them here, Lord, a long way. They, they, they hurt and they never, never, never would have come to you as far as they have. If it hadn't been for these things. So, Father, let them just in faith now breathe. I forgive you to those. Now, Father, let them also breathe out. I trust you, Father. And I'm looking now to you. And I'm, I'm no longer looking at this as just mean people that have hurt me. But I believe that your hand was at work because you came. Father, begin to work healing in their heart. Begin to work them to such a degree that they will see your son and that they will be able to go back into that dark, soupy world of storm and grab the hands of some others who are bitter or hurting and pull them out also. Father, go do beyond what my pitiful little prayers praying here. You're saying things to people's heart. Confirm your word to them. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.